The Easter Egg by Saki. It was distinctly hard lines for Lady Barbara, who came of good fighting stock and was one of the bravest women of her generation, that her son should be so undisguisedly a coward. Whatever good qualities Lester Slagby may have possessed, and he was in some respects charming, courage could certainly never be imputed to him. As a child he had suffered from childish timidity, as a boy from unboyish funk, and as a youth he had exchanged unreasoning fears for others which were more formidable from the fact of having a carefully thought-out basis. He was frankly afraid of animals, nervous with firearms, and never crossed the channel without mentally comparing the numerical proportion of life belts to passengers. On horseback he seemed to require as many hands as a Hindu god, at least four for clutching the reins, and two more for patting the horse soothingly on the neck. Lady Barbara no longer pretended not to see her son's prevailing weakness. With her usual courage, she faced the knowledge of it squarely, and, mother-like, loved him nonetheless. Continental travel, anywhere away from the great tourist tracks, was a favourite hobby with Lady Barbara, and Lester joined her as often as possible. Eastertide usually found her at Nobletheim, an upland township in one of those small princedoms that make inconspicuous freckles on the map of Central Europe. A long-standing acquaintanceship with the reigning family made her a personage of due importance in the eyes of her old friend the Burgomaster, and she was anxiously consulted by that worthy on the momentous occasion when the prince made known his intention of coming in person to open a sanatorium outside the town. All the usual items in a programme of welcome, some of them fatuous and commonplace, others quaint and charming, had been arranged for, but the burgomaster hoped that the resourceful English lady might have something new and tasteful to suggest in the way of loyal greeting. The prince was known to the outside world, if at all, as an old-fashioned reactionary, combating modern progress, as it were, with a wooden sword. To his own people he was known as a kindly old gentleman with a certain endearing stateliness, which had nothing of standoffishness about it. Nobletheim was anxious to do its best. Lady Barbara discussed the matter with Lester and one or two acquaintances in her little hotel, but ideas were difficult to come by. "'Might I suggest something to the Gnedige Frau?' asked a sallow, high-cheek-boned lady, to whom the Englishwoman had spoken once or twice, and whom she had set down in her mind as probably a southern Slav. "'Might I suggest something for the reception fest?' she went on, with a certain shy eagerness. "'Our little child here, our baby, we will dress him in a little white coat, with small wings, as an Easter angel, and he will carry a large white Easter egg, and inside shall be a basket of plover eggs.' of which the prince is so fond, and he shall give it to his highness as Easter offering. It is so pretty an idea, we have seen it done once in Styria. Lady Barba looked dubiously at the proposed Easter angel, a fair, wooden-faced child of about four years old. She had noticed it the day before in the hotel, and wondered how such a tow-headed child could belong to such a dark-visaged couple as the woman and her husband, probably, she thought, an adopted baby especially as the couple were not young. "'Of course Nadiga Frau will escort the little child up to the prince,' pursued the woman, "'but he will be quite good and do as he is told. "'We have some pluffers' eggs shall come fresh from Vienne,' said the husband. The small child and Lady Barbara seemed equally unenthusiastic about the pretty idea. Lester was openly discouraging, but when the burgomaster heard of it he was enchanted.' The combination of sentiment and plover's eggs appealed strongly to his Teutonic mind. On the eventful day, the Easter angel, really quite prettily and quaintly dressed, was a centre of kindly interest to the gala crowd marshalled to receive his highness. The mother was unobtrusive and less fussy than most parents would have been under the circumstances, merely stipulating that she should place the Easter egg herself in the arms that had been carefully schooled how to hold the precious burden. Then Lady Barbara moved forward, the child marching stolidly and with grim determination at her side. It had been promised cakes and sweets galore if it gave the egg well and truly to the kind old gentleman who was waiting to receive it. Lester had tried to convey to it privately that horrible smackings would attend any failure in its share of the proceedings. 
but it is doubtful if his German caused more than an immediate distress. Lady Barbara had thoughtfully provided herself with an emergency supply of chocolate sweetmeats. Children may sometimes be time servers, but they do not encourage long accounts. As they approached nearer to the princely dais, Lady Barbara stood discreetly aside, and the stolid-faced infant walked forward alone. With staggering but steadfast gait, encouraged by a murmur of elderly approval, Lester, standing in the front row of the onlookers, turned to scan the crowd for the beaming faces of the happy parents. In a side road which led to the railway station, he saw a cab. Entering the cab with every appearance of furtive haste were the dark-visaged couple who had been so plausibly eager for the pretty idea. The sharpened instinct of cowardice lit up the situation to him in one swift flash. The blood roared and surged to his head. As though thousands of floodgates had been opened in his veins and arteries, and his brain was the common sluice in which all the torrents met. He saw nothing but a blur around him. Then the blood ebbed away in quick waves, till his very heart seemed drained and empty, and he stood nervelessly, helplessly, dumbly watching the child bearing its accursed burden with slow, relentless steps nearer and nearer to the group that waited sheep-like to receive him. A fascinated curiosity compelled Lester to turn his head towards the fugitives, the cab had started at hot pace in the direction of the station. The next moment Lester was running, running faster than any of those present had ever seen a man run, and he was not running away. For that stray fraction of his life some unwanted impulse beset him, some hint of the stock he came from, and he ran unflinchingly towards danger. He stooped and clutched at the Easter egg, as one tries to scoop up the ball in rugby football. What he meant to do with it he had not considered. The thing was to get it. But the child had been promised cakes and sweetmeats, if it safely gave the egg into the hands of the kindly old gentleman. It uttered no scream, but it held to its charge with limpid grip. Lester sank to his knees, tugging savagely at the tightly clasped burden, and angry cries rose from the scandalized onlookers. A questioning, threatening ring formed around him, then shrank back in recoil as he shrieked out one hideous word. Lady Barbara heard the word and saw the crowd race away like scattered sheep, saw the prince forcibly hustled away by his attendants. Also she saw her son lying prone in an agony of overmastering terror, his spasm of daring shattered by the child's unexpected resistance. Still clutching frantically, as though for safety, at that white satin gewgaw, unable to crawl even from its deadly neighbourhood, able only to scream and scream and scream. In her brain she was dimly conscious of balancing, or striving to balance, the abject shame which had him now in thrall against the one compelling act of courage which had flung him grandly and madly onto the point of danger. It was only for the fraction of a minute that she stood watching the two entangled figures, the infant with its woodenly obstinate face and body tense with dogged resistance, and the boy limp and already nearly dead with a terror that almost stifled his screams and over them the long gala streamers flapping gaily in the sunshine. She never forgot the scene, but then it was the last she ever saw. Lady Barbara carries her scarred face with its sightless eyes as bravely as ever in the world, but at Easter tide her friends are careful to keep from her ears any mention of the children's Easter symbol.